It's electioneering at its best from the governor and the Republican establishment. Bombshell for Broward School. I respect the grand jury report, although I strongly disagree with many portions of it. Deceit, neglect, a grand jury names names and points fingers. This is a very delicate and uh, difficult uh, issue. Congressman Mario diaz Ballard votes no on the Inflation Reduction Act. Newcomer Democrat versus veteran Democrat. He's voted with Republicans. The House race getting heated. The big stories of the week on This Week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg, and we begin with that grand jury report that calls for the ouster of four Broward School Board members. The final report, years in the making, examines school safety, the spending for it, and why progress was lost in bureaucracy. The report names names, makes a case for incompetence, deceit, and public propaganda to cover it all up. Several county districts in Florida are included in that report, including Miami-Dade, but the Broward School District gets the biggest focus and the most criticism. And this morning, we are going to speak with two members of the Broward School Board. We had planned to speak with them together, but an attorney said it would not be a violation. Our attorney said it would not be a violation of the Sunshine Law. However, Laurie Rich Levinson's attorney said it might be. So we're going to speak with board member Debbie Hickson in a minute. But let's begin with Ms. Levinson, who has been on the school board for 12 years, currently serving as the chair, and she is one of the four serving board members recommended for suspension. Lori, good morning. We're glad to see you. Good morning. Good morning, Michael and Glenna. Thank you for having me on today. You're quite welcome. Well, the grand jury report, as you well know, says that you and the other four board members allegedly engaged in incompetence and neglect of duty. It recommends that you be suspended from office. What is your response? My response is that this is a political hatchet job. It is retaliation by the governor against Broward Democrats and to release this report right before an election and a major referendum that will benefit our teachers and students that is on the ballot on Tuesday. I'm outraged um, that this has been used in this type of fashion. So, Lori, let's let's just take on um, that concept for a moment. The grand jury for this convened in 2014. That was long before mm -hmm. Governor DeSantis was Governor DeSantis. And and it was released by the Florida Supreme Court. Um, it actually was released a few months ago. It was made public just now. And it aside from the criticisms, which we'll get into, it, it has a, a component. The grand jury wrote in its report uh, specifically how this is a very diverse grand jury. We come from all areas. We come from all parties, all races, all ethnicities. They, they made a really big point about how this is not a political document. Okay, I, and I greatly respect the service of the individuals on this grand jury. But actually, Governor DeSantis did stand there and um, in panel this grand jury with the 17 families from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas standing by him. And my heart always goes out to those families and the grief they will always have. And he stood there and said that this would look at school safety. And when you read this report, over three quarters of it has nothing to do with school safety. And it certainly did not find what was expected for the four issues that the grand jury was in panel for. Uh, Lori, as you well know, this uh, grand jury report, as Lena said, was made public or it was submitted to the Supreme Court in April. And then I believe you and other board members uh, went into court and asked that your names be redacted, taken out of this, and you appealed up to the state Supreme Court, which is why on Friday it was released. So, uh, I mean, you tried, have you not tried to keep this and keep your name out of this report? I'm not gonna really speak about myself or my colleagues as far as the appeal process. Um, 
But what I really would like to talk about is what the report actually speaks to. It was in panel to find safety violations, to find fraud and deceit regarding safety in throughout Florida, but as we all know, it was targeted directly for Broward County. And that was not able to be found in this report. And I believe this political weapon, unfortunately, um, was done using these families as political pawns to come after uh, Broward County and the Democrats that serve on the school board. And partisan politics has no place in education. You know, the 111, or I'm sorry, 122 page report actually does find very specific instances of fraud and deceit, mismanagement, malfeasance, uh, school security, not only in the uh, school safety and security component, but in the construction of co collapsing roofs and, and moldy classrooms. So, um, you know, I, I read every word of it. I'm sure you did too. And, and I found plenty of instances where the grand jury really made a case and named names for hiring people who might not have been up for the job, hiring vendors who mm -hmm. had shady pass, running out of money, poor planning. Um, on page 72, it specifically mentions your name uh, about talking about trying to alter the language for the public in covering up some of this alleged mismanagement and it quotes you as saying, we don't want people to think we're running out of money for, for those projects um, when the district actually was. So, so there is detail and there are quotes and, and so I'm not quite sure you know, what, you, what you think is not there. Okay, I will speak exactly to that. The district was not running out of money Unfortunately, and I will state that boards are policy makers. We are the governing board. Administrate, uh, we have administrators that are hired superintendent to run the district. A third party vendor was hired to do a needs assessment on all the facilities in Broward County Public Schools. And one of my colleagues who is not named in this report suggested that we use our staff with them so combined, they went out and did a needs assessment of every facility in this district. And we went out for a bond based on the valuation that was given to us. There was no deceit. We went out with that amount and then found out afterwards that that was undervalued. Well, the so grand jury- th That is not to factual. The, to that point, the grand jury says that the reason that the schools did their, their own assessment is because they didn't want to hire a consultant and makes the point that the people who did these assessments were not qualified to do so, which the grand jury says is actually the very foundation of the problems to come with the being over budget and finding issues and not being able to complete the projects. It was a combination of the outside firm and our employees who did that valuation. So regardless of how it was done, it was supported unanimously by the board to go out and do that. And it was undervalued. And we can only work as policymakers with the information that was given to us. There's a lot of editorial in this. And it was done for one reason only. And it was to come after our former superintendent and every board member who supported him subsequent to the tragedy. Yeah, Lori, uh, before we run out of time, just one more time, I want to ask you about the political component of this. The Broward School Board, as we all know, defied the governor on COVID-19 protocols on masking, and it really angered him. And you, your pay was docked by the state of Florida, among other things. Is this, in your view, just part of payback for being defiant of the governor? I think absolutely. I think this has been released at a time to confuse the public. It is 100% being used as a political weapon. There's a major referendum on Tuesday that involves people yeah. in our district. All of our teachers 
who need this additional compensation. It hires 500 safety and security yeah. personnel. Yeah. The Speaking timing, to safety and I'm, security I'm sorry, personnel. I'm going to have to jump in here. You're right. The timing is not good for the referendum. It's it's quite yeah. suspect. Yeah, we, we understand. Laurie Rich Levinson, we're very glad to speak with you this morning. Thank we'll you, Laurie. We'll see what happens next. Thank you very much. Thanks. And up next, another perspective on that grand jury report from board member Debbie Hickson. We will speak to her after the break. Debbie Hickson was elected to the Broward School Board in 2020. She came under no criticism in this grand jury report. Ms. Hickson ran for the school board after her husband, Chris, was killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where he was the athletic director. She's also a nationally certified teacher, and she is here with us right now via Zoom. Debbie, great to see you. Debbie, welcome. We are so glad to see you. Good morning. Thank you for um, inviting me. Of course, let me ask you the question that Glenna and I began with asking Lori, and that is, what is your take on the grand jury report? Is it a roadmap to fixing problems uh, in the Broward County public schools, especially with regards to safety? Um, I do believe that there's a lot in there that um, relates to safety that needs to be looked at. There are things, um, especially in the building department, that definitely need to be addressed immediately. And not just in Broward County there, um, as you mentioned, when you were speaking with Ms. Rich Levinson, there are other counties, uh, Orange County, Miami-Dade and Palm Beach that were also named and highlighted for issues that needed to be addressed um, concerning safety and different things. So I do think that we should look at it. We should, um, you know, look at the recommendations that are in there and make sure that we are doing the right thing to move forward to make sure that our students and staff are safe. So you are, I mean, it's been two years, but you are a relatively new member of the school board after that horrific event. You, Lori Aladef as well, who lost her daughter at MSD. Uh, Sarah Leonardi is fairly new. And um, of course, Dan Foganoli is brand new, just put in by the governor to replace Dr. Osgood. But you, um, you and Sarah Leonardi are, are mentioned in this report exactly once, just to say they're not going to mention you because you had nothing to do with anything. Mm -hmm. um, but they, uh, it's kind of an awkward, I'm sure, position for you to be on with us and, and answering questions like the one I'm about to ask you. The report says, determines that the school board, and, and outlines why, is a cesspool of bu bureaucracy and politics and almost inertia on the board because of infighting. Did you find that? Are you finding that now that you're on it? Um, I would say I probably have a different experience than other people. Um, there are things that are listed in there that um, I have been um, complaining about for a little while. But I, um, you know, I think that a lot of it has to do more with staff that um, is comfortable in the position that they're in and not maybe have been held accountable for some of the decisions that have come across and presented to the school board. They have a certain way of um, spinning answers sometimes. So that's really for me, what was in this um, grand jury report kind of validates some of the things that I have had concerns about um, more in terms of staff and the things that are happening um, across the district and what's being presented to us. So I really um, am looking forward to the superintendent combing through this and pulling out those things that I have um, brought to her attention a number of times and definitely holding people accountable. At the end of the day, we hold our students and our staff accountable when they don't do appropriate things. And that is really what um, I'm hoping comes out of this grand jury report being released. Yeah, uh, Debbie, uh, this really, uh, as Glenna has said, is a bombshell in that it calls for the governor to suspend four of the remaining uh, board members on the school board that who you serve with. Uh, what is your feeling about their suspensions if the governor should go ahead and do that? You know, that's a, a decision for the governor. It isn't a decision that I'm going to weigh in on because it isn't up to me. Yeah. Uh, well, whatever. Let, me, let me ask you to, excuse me, let me ask okay. you to weigh in on this then. Broward County is the most democratic county in the state of Florida. 
Uh, Governor DeSantis has had one chance to appoint someone to serve out an unexpired term on the board uh, when Ruslan Osgood was uh, elected to the state Senate. Now he's got a chance to put four people on the board and you would expect he's going to appoint Republicans to the board. Not that they can't do the job, but it, it certainly is not in keeping with sort of the traditions and the politics of the, of the school board. Well, you, you kind of um, hit the, a nail on the head there. The school board shouldn't have politics in it, right? The whole purpose of, of the school board is to make policy so that our students can be as successful as possible in whatever policy centers around that. So um, if that's a decision that he chooses to make, I would just implore him to put people in there, not because of what political party that they are in, but that they have the best interest of our students and the education of our students in mind, um, you know, when they're making policy. And that's, at the end of the day, what we ask of anybody who sits in the seat on the school board. You know, this, the grand jury was convened for some very specific issues to look into whether there was a refusal or a failure to follow the mandates of this smart plan, the security plan, the renovation plan. Um, and there was another thing, and actually you just brought it up, that's why I wanted to go back to it. Was there a systematic underreporting of criminal activities in schools, and not just Broward? And in fact, this report does say, does seem to suggest that in Miami-Dade and Broward school districts were, were kind of cooking the books on the number of kids who got in trouble or arrested and didn't report that number to the Department of Education, tried to, to make the school district look safer than it was. Have you seen that? Uh, well, I will say since Dr. Cartwright has come on board that um, the issue has been addressed and actually at the last um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission meeting. Uh, she was um, commended on, on the changes that have been made and that um, Broward should be looked at as a model county for the things that we're doing. So I, um, I, I when this came out, those were issues that were of concern. And I, before I ran for school board, before I even thought about running for school board, I was um, complaining and writing to doc, uh, Mr. Runcy and the school board members about the, the lack of sense of urgency on how we were addressing safety in the schools because I continued to be a teacher in a school even after um, the shooting happened. So I would say at this point, we want to use what's there to move forward. And I would say in lots of places, at least in Broward County, that there have been corrections that have been made to make sure that we're moving forward and being honest and transparent about what's happening um, with behavior and, and security issues in our schools. And you are living that in a very profound way firsthand. Debbie Hickson, great to have you with us. Debbie, thanks. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you. Up next, conversation with the congressman. The views and votes of Mario diaz Balart. He'll join us live when we come back. As you undoubtedly know, Tuesday is primary election day. South Florida Congressman Mario diaz Balart is a political powerhouse not really worried about what's going to happen to him on Tuesday. The veteran rep joined the rest of congressional Republicans voting against the Inflation Reduction Act, a new law touted as a game changer for the economy, for climate change, and for medical costs as well. The congressman joins us now via Zoom. Good morning to you. Great to see you. Good to see both of you. Congressman, great, great to see you. Well, let's go through a little bit of the Inflation Reduction Act. You voted against it, even though it's got several provisions, which I'm sure your constituents uh, would like. It does really the most serious attack on climate change in the history of the United States government. It would bring down the cost of prescription drugs for seniors on Medicare. Insulin would be capped at $35 per month. Uh, it would impose 15% tax on large corporations and on people earning more than 400000 a year, and it supposedly would even reduce the deficit. Now, all of that sounds pretty good. Why did you vote against it? 
Michael, thank you. Uh, a, a couple of things. You, you mentioned what the Democrats are saying about the bill, except that it is basically a little bit smaller version of the Green New Deal. Um, you talk about climate and the question has to be asked, how much will it actually re reduce temperature? The answer is zero. What it will do, however, is make uh, energy more expensive, less available in the United States, empowering, by the way, communist China, it raises taxes. You're right. you're absolutely right. Even um, Mr. Biden, before he was president, said that it was insane, irresponsible to raise taxes during a recession, and yet he's done so. It also, by the way, hires almost 90,000 additional IRS agents, IRS agents to go after the American people, the working class, the middle class. Yeah, well, let me put that if in perspective. I can, yeah, Mary, if I, just, I'm sorry, Michael, I beg your pardon, but let me, let me jump in and just simply yeah. say, as a citizen, you know, in the last year or two, I don't know, I tried to call the IRS. You right. can never get anybody on the phone. They are underfunded. They have too few people working for them and too few of these tax returns from wealthy people are being audited. I mean, they needed some help there, didn't they? But let me put it in perspective, a very small percentage, less than 5%, I believe, actually goes to help consumers. The rest are actually to go against and to go uh, audit the American people. Again, putting in perspective, if you got uh, the, uh, uh, what, the, the stadium in Hollywood, the Hard Rock Stadium, you filled it up with these new I IRS agents, you would still need another 20,000 seats someplace <laughs> because it would fill the stadium a lot more. This is larger than the entire, it's about twice the size of the members of the United States Coast Guard. Think so about that's, that. Um, so you're to go after the American people, and uh, they're not going to go after the wealthy. They're not going to go after corporations. Look at what the CBO has stated. They're going to go after farmers, middle class Americans, uh, working class Americans. Yeah. Go after them. So, this Congressman, is it is that, highly grotesque and irresponsible. That what what you're saying now. You so you have an issue with the numbers. Um, the I the numbers of IRS hires were actually started, the talks for that were started in the last administration. So this isn't brand new to this to this bill. But there's nothing but in the, the bill increase, that there was the increase of almost ninety the increase. thousand right. IRS. So there, agents there's really nothing in the specifically in this bill. And if you love the IRS and you want to, them to go after you, then you should be <laughs> Who doesn't upset love at me. the IRS? So let yeah. me just <laughs> let, let me just go back into a little bit of detail there. So I'm talking about the numbers, the increase to the staffing of the IRS was actually being discussed under the last administration. And yes, is for sure it's in this bill. But let me let me read you what at least uh, University of Pennsylvania, ha Wharton, has kind of crunched all this. Um, the 80 billion over the next decade for IRS enforcement activities is for the hiring and training for IT systems modernization and for taxpayer services, coupled with what also is in the bill is this uh, carried interest tax reform, which kind of was what you were talking about. Th this applies to taxpayers with incomes exceeding four hundred thousand dollars a year so there's there's nothing about the irs going after the average american there Except the numbers that are there not, that that, that band-aid is not there that's not what the cbo has expressed has expressed and, and remember this is a huge revenue source and the way they get their revenue is how it's not by customer service glenna it's by going after the american people tax this cheaters is all about. going after that's tax how. cheaters, tax cheaters. Going it's, after it tax is, again, it is going after, this is very simple. Look, if you think, if anybody thinks that the IRS needs more bureaucrats to audit more working class Americans, more power to you. But I'm telling you, twice, just the increase is twice the size, roughly, of the entire United States Coast Guard for God's sake. This is not a small increase in the IRS. This is a brutal increase to go after the American people. Yeah. And they're supposed to get hundreds of billions of dollars from this increase in IRS agents. Yeah. How, where, where's that coming from? So coming what, from let me just ask you one, one more question to button this up. One more question to button this up. So if people, whoever, corporations, whoever, businesses, big or small, are, are cheating on their taxes, should they not be made to pay? Glenna, it's not corporations. Corporations are audited all the time. They have reams of lawyers. This is specifically to go after small businesses, restaurants, dry cleaners, farmers. That's where they're trying to get the money. And again, 
if any, there aren't that many corporations in the entire country to hire almost 90,000 new IRS agents. Logic will dictate who they're going to go after. And not only that, by this is just part of the problems with this bill. It's going to increase inflation. Even Bernie Sanders, for God's sake, has said that this is not going to help inflation. It's going to increase inflation. Okay, it's, the it's, act would very slightly increase inflation in, until 2024 and decrease inflation thereafter. That's yeah, the assessment the of the same. University of Pennsylvania Correct. Wharton budget model, which you referenced to criticize this bill. Well, no, I reference pretty much everybody and their mama as far as criticizing this bill. <laughs> I mean, come on. This bill is as catastrophic as one can imagine. And by the way, the same people that told us that inflation was going to be transitory, the same people that have said it was only for the wealthy. Remember, high class are now the, are now the ones claiming that the IR, IRS agents are only going to go after the wealthy. All right, the, Congressman. Let's, this let's, is insane. Let, since you have, excuse me. Since you have brought up inflation, let's talk about it a little bit. Uh, it has ticked down in the last month just a bit. It's still enormously high. It's probably about 9%. Uh, rents are sky high. Uh, but gasoline has gone from $5 a gallon to less than 4 There seems to be some small but meaningful improvements here uh, in the cost of living. Would you acknowledge that? Actually, no. The American people are hurting. Uh, look, to to celebrate when gasoline went down a dollar, when it's still about twice what it was before this president uh, took office, is is just not you, Mike Michael, but it's disingenuous. All right, the American people are struggling. We still have the highest inflation in 40 years. Gasoline prices are still ridiculously expensive, and this bill, by the way, further goes after and continues the war against domestic energy. By the way, the big beneficiary really is China, because that's uh, where and that's where all the products that we're going to need to buy in order to satisfy this bill, it's, they're controlled by communist China. This is again, these are statements of fact. All right, so we're up. We're up against a break. People, we're up against it's a hurting, break. It's I just the American people. It's helping China. That's why I voted against it. It's a pretty easy bill to vote against. As we go to break, I just want to also say that in in this bill are tax credits for using American-made products. In that effort, more to come with you if you'll stay with us. I know you will. We'll Hold on there, <laughs> Congressman. All right, we'll be right back. Welcome back on this Sunday on This Week in South Florida. Congressman Mario Duz a member of Congress since 2013. Uh, Congressman, uh, we want to ask you about comments that were made this week. Uh, on a Spanish language radio program by Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez. She said that when undocumented immigrants arrive in Florida, they ought to be put on buses and sent to Delaware, the uh, president's home state. Uh, you know, this strikes a lot of people as very mean spirited coming from, you know, a Cuban immigre family, indeed, your family famously, you know, came from Cuba. Um, what is your reaction to what uh, the lieutenant governor said? Yeah, look, I think there is uh, a lot of reason to be concerned about the violation of the rule of law that's taking place under this administration. And the folks who are determining who comes in across the southern border are the cartels, the drug cartels. And so expressing her frustration for that, uh, her support of the rule of law, I think really is frankly what the American people want. They want the United States to follow the law, to adhere to the rule of law and to the Constitution. And so um, I think her frustration is well stated. Yeah, but, but her comment, I believe, was related specifically to undocumented immigrants coming into Florida. And the great majority of those are Cuban. Of course, the Cuban Adjustment Act is still on the books, you know, and they are asking to be applied to them. Is she saying, do you think that Cubans ought to be sent to Delaware? No, I think what she's saying is that, uh, you know, the, the states that are, in particular, these uh, sanctuary states and cities around the country um, that for a long time have been, you know, saying these things without suffering the consequences of bad policies should frankly feel some of the policies, the bad policies uh, caused by this administration. We are seeing now record number of fentanyl, which, by the way, has led to record number of Americans dying 
in this country because of uh, uh, overdoses, most of it caused by fentanyl, most of it coming from the southern border. And so, you know, it's very nice for, you know, uh, states in the Northeast and around the country uh, controlled by, you know, liberal left wing Democrats to want to be sanctuary states when, in fact, they don't receive any of the folks uh, that are coming over again. So should they just be totally um, uh, should they not feel any of the results of their statements or should they, by the way, share in some of the burden that other states are going through because of the broken policies of this administration? Not to mention the fact that I believe the most important thing is to adhere, adhere to the rule of law. And this administration is totally ignoring the law and the rule of law. All right. So so go with me on this for a minute. To, to your point, the and Local 10 has done so much reporting on fentanyl coming over the southern border and the crisis at the border. Um, let, let's set that aside just for this moment, uh, because this week and this month, South Florida shores are seeing record numbers of migrants, so many of them coming from Cuba all of a sudden. Th that is not, by all accounts, a drug issue. That is a migrant escaping mm -hmm. to the United States issue. And what the lieutenant governor said on the radio yesterday is that the state of Florida will be joining as policy the, what the state of Texas and Arizona uh, states are doing in this busing to other, um, to D.C. is what she said, or to Delaware is what she said. And I, and I guess the question is, she was, she was making those comments right after a discussion on this record number of Cuban migrants coming to Florida. And it sounded as if she was recommending that these Cuban migrants be put on those buses. So, so I think the question is, the, the status of a Cuban migrant right now is that of any other, can make an asylum claim and can be paroled to do that. And as, a, as someone who's worked on bipartisan immigration reform, stymied at every level, what is your perspective on, on busing Cuban families here looking for family and help to a state like Delaware? Great question, Glenn. I think it's important that those from wherever their country, and I think those that probably have a better potential claim for asylum of people leaving, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, places like that, obviously. And they, but, but they're suffering the consequences of this broken policy as well, because the situation on the border is so bad, so broken, so out of control, that folks that have legitimate claims are not being able to have their cases heard any differently than those that are, frankly, illegitimate claims, abusive claims. So, so again, the system is so broken that those who have legitimate claims, you mentioned Cubans, Nicaraguans, Venezuelans, who should have, by the way, probably the highest po possibility of having legitimate claims, they're suffering the consequences of this broken border. Look, I don't, I don't usually quote and I, you know, the, the vice president, this vice president of the United States, but she's talked a lot about root causes. The root cause of the issue that you're talking about, the number of Cubans who are now coming at sea, well, look, this happened during the Carter administration. This happened during the Clinton administration. This happened during the Obama administration. And it's happening now. It didn't happen under the Trump administration, the Bush's administration, or the Reagan administration. You know what the root cause is? It's, frankly, weakness, bad policy by the President of the United States, and all of the thugs, all of the enemies of freedom, whether it's the Castro regime, the Maluto regime, the Chinese Communist regime, you name it, they're taking advantage of a feckless president who is clueless about how to deal with these issues. And then the legislation that they bring forward helps China, hurts the American people, increases inflation, and by the way, uh, increases gasoline prices. So we shouldn't be surprised that the root cause of all of the issues that we're dealing with, including this one, is bad policies by a feckless administration and a party that controls House, Senate, and White House. And hopefully, if the American people want it so, that will change in November. Congressman Maria Duisbeler, it's always a delight to have you on our program. We enjoy the kind of the uh, uh, back and forth here with you. Respect your point of view. Thanks very much. Thank you, Congressman. Thank both of you. Okay. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. Of course. All right, up next, a Democrat versus Democrat. A newcomer challenges a veteran for his cross-party votes. When you are the incumbent, when you hold an elective office, the chances generally are excellent that you will keep that office unless you do something that angers your constituents or your party colleagues. 
South Florida veteran state representative James Bush, a Democrat, finds himself in the crosshairs of his own state party because he's crossed party lines on some social and school issues to vote with Republicans. His primary challenger now is a Miami attorney, Ashley Gant, right there, a first time <laughs> candidate with the support of prominent state Democrats. Representative Bush actually declined to join us. He's a pastor and says he has other Sunday obligations. So Ashley, it is all you, and we are so happy that you're joining us. <laughs> Ashley, Thank welcome. You. It's great. Thank you. Great to see you again. Saw you in Overtown a couple of weeks ago. Well, we yeah. regret, as Glenna said, that uh, Representative Bush is not here to debate you, to present you know, uh, his side of the argument. What is your side of the argument? Why are you the better candidate here? Well, first, I want to say thank you um, for allowing me this opportunity today. I'm the better candidate because I want to represent the interests of all of my community. Um, as you stated earlier, the incumbent has crossed party lines. And when he crossed those party lines, it was to disenfranchise Floridians and to take away our rights. And we live in a democracy and we live in a country that boasts to be the country of freedom. And so that's what I want to hold him and the government accountable to those values that we purport are American values. And so uh, being that we live in a democracy, uh, I decided that I'm going to exercise my right, my freedom to hold my elected official accountable and challenge him. And so that my my community, I grew up in this district, we can have someone who not only is present, is transparent, who answers to their record, but also who advocates for rights to be given and people to have freedom instead of having rights rolled back. So it, it sounds like you are speaking about those, what people are calling the culture war votes that were taking during session, um, abortion restrictions are one of them and curriculum school restrictions among them. But you're talking about serving the community. So, you know, I'm not here to defend anybody, but I certainly am here to make things fair and to challenge the narrative. So let me ask you, in District 109, you know, Representative Bush has been representing these communities for decades, 30 years, 30 and years. his votes um, for abortion restrictions this time, he also, he also voted for voucher expansion. Those are the things that Republicans were very much behind. Mm -hmm. And his reasons, as he told me, was that he was representing his constituents. So many, so many politicians get criticized for voting, you know, towing the party line. And he says he voted because he comes from a very a democratic district but a socially conservative district who is anti-abortion, who values school choice. So, uh, so wouldn't that be serving his community? I think that um, he probably believes that, but I grew up in this community. I am a constituent and uh, we have a very diverse community in District 109. It includes neighborhoods from downtown to Opelika and the majority of the population in the district is women, black women, Hispanic women, and um, white women. And so when you, I don't know what uh, constituents he is referring to in regards to um, a conservative uh, base, but we have a lot of young voters who when I get out, knock on doors or go to different events and just meet people, a lot of people are angry and they're constituents and they're um, they're all ages. And so after a Roe v. Wade was overturned, for example, I've been knocking on doors for months and with the older uh, population in the community, that has been a touch and go conversation because while some people are pro-life and some people are pro-choice. What I've gotten a resounding um, sentiment from uh, people of all ages is the government should still not tell someone what to do with their bodies. Yeah. And uh, when I say, Ms. Kent, let me let me let me move on to another sort of related topic. You are a graduate of the University of Florida. After that, you went off and you were a member of Teach for America. You have been a public school teacher. So if you were in the classroom now, would you find it wrong that you could not talk about racial history uh, in Florida or anywhere else? 
um, you know, the way that you, that you would like to? Absolutely. So I actually started off with Teach for America as a history teacher. And when I came back home to Florida to teach, um, I, I started with history and then I um, got my English uh, certification. But yes, I would. Um, not only because that's the truth of this country and to create progressive leaders, we have to have um, a myriad of thoughts and those thoughts start with the truth. But that's a part of my heritage. I got the last name because I can trace back to the last generation of enslaved people in my family, uh, my great, great, great grandfather. And that's how I got the name Gant. It's, and so to think that I cannot tell the truth or tell the history of this country um, I think it's absurd. And I think it is um, doing a great disservice to our children and the future generations of Floridians and Americans, because history is very important and it informs us how, on how to progress as a community and as a nation. Uh, what we, uh, you know, welcome to television time. We have about a minute left. <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, um, you know, District 109 is one district, but electing Democrats is so important to the party because the numbers are, they just don't have the math in Tallahassee and nothing can get done. So statewide to Democrats, you're very important. Uh, and so I guess my question is, in an effort to support you, there's been some stuff flying around and uh, you know some tweets, Senator Jason Pizzo lets it fly regularly and he has been. <laughs> And yeah. um, and there's been some backlash, and I was wondering if you would weigh in on on the state of the uh, atmosphere of this race, and if you condone things like that and support things like that. Well, I would like to first say I'm very grateful for Senator Pizzo's um, support. He's been very supportive from the very beginning. Um, and as far as you know, what went on last week with the press conferences and what you're referring to, the comments um, in the political article, I, I think that's a conversation between two colleagues. And I think there are two grown men that can have this conversation about their feelings about each other because I don't want it to distract from the fact that we need someone right. in our community to represent our Ms. community. Ms. Gant, that's going to be the final word. We're so <laughs> glad you were able to join us and good luck on Tuesday. Thanks, Thanks so, so much. much. I appreciate it. Okay, we'll be right back. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, you know what to do. Scan that QR code with your phone right there. It takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And we thank you, as always, for spending this hour with us. And remember, Local10 is online 24-7. And always remember, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.